I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life here many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plough shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. The translation of the scripture, corrupted by William Tyndale, shall be utterly expelled, rejected, and put away out of the hands of the people. All manner of books of the Old and New Testament in English, being of the crafty, false and untrue translation of Tyndale, shall be clearly and utterly abolished, extinguished and forbidden to be kept or used in this realm. First, he maintained that faith alone justifies. Second, he maintained that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel was enough for salvation. Third, he averred that human traditions cannot bind the conscience except where their neglect might occasion scandal. Fourth, he denied the Lord! Open the King of England's eyes! But above all, beware ye rest not the word to your own appetite as over many do, making it like a bell to sound as you please to interpret, but by the contrary, frame all your affections to follow the rule there set down. When you read the scripture, read it with a sanctified and chaste ear, admire reverently such obscure places as ye understand not, blaming only your own incapacity. Hi, this is Pastor Jonathan Shelley from Pure Words Baptist Church. And the point of this documentary is to help people realize that we have the greatest treasure on earth, the Bible. Many people don't realize where the Bible came from. And the point of this documentary is to show through history and the doctrine of preservation, how we have a Bible from Moses all the way to the one I hold in my hand today. After the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, the gospel was spread throughout all the world. This caused the scriptures to be translated into many different languages over the next few centuries. In 382 AD, Jerome of Stridon translated the Bible into Latin, which became the official translation of the Roman Catholic Church. And by 500 AD, the Bible had been translated into over 500 languages. Despite hundreds of translations being available, the Roman Catholic Church prohibited access to the Bible for common people. 
This time period is referred to as the Dark Ages, where the scripture was restricted to the Latin translation used by the Catholic Church. Furthermore, from the 13th century to the 19th century, Rome enacted a myriad of laws making it illegal for common people to obtain the Word of God and read it in their own language. In AD 1215, Pope Innocent III issued a law commanding that anyone who translates the Bible would be seized for trial and penalties. He stated, As by the old law, the beast that touching the holy month was to be stoned to death, so simple and uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. People would be persecuted if they quoted any scripture. I mean, we have testimonies of children quoting scripture and their parents getting into trouble for that. So that was a real point of persecution because uh, the church wanted to hold on to its power and reading the Bible gave power to the individual because they saw that this was what God is saying. This might be not what the church is saying. So. It was a real, real hard time. In 1229 AD, the Council of Toulouse made it illegal for laymen to possess or read the Bible for themselves, and the Council of Tarragona in AD 1234 ordered all vernacular versions to be brought to the bishop to be burned. In rebellion and contrast to Rome's view of scripture, brave men like John Wycliffe challenged the status quo of the Catholic Church by translating the Bible into the language of the people. Wycliffe was very concerned because, and of course he only knew Latin and was only working with Latin, but he was concerned with what he called goddess law. He felt that God's law was more important and more authoritative than the church's uh, power and authority. So he felt that they were abusing uh, indulgences and abusing a lot of the power that they had. And so that's why he wanted to translate the Bible. The Bible in its entirety wasn't translated to English until Wycliffe's translation produced in the Middle English period in 1382. With the help of his assistants, John Purvey and others, later revisions were produced in 1388 and 1395. We had the Latin, but people weren't speaking Latin anymore. It got to the point where the Vulgate is no longer Vulgate. It's no longer common, it's no longer vulgar anymore because people aren't speaking Latin. So of course there's another need for a new Jerome, quote unquote, where he's gonna start translating the Bible into their tongue, which would be English. And this is where you get men by the name of John Wycliffe, who ended up translating a Bible into English. It's a decent, uh, a good translation, very literal. Uh, he keeps a lot of the word order. He didn't have anything to follow as far as what principles you use for translating the Bible. So he had to make up his own. Now this was not at the desire or wishes of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church still is wanting to pre prevent people from hearing the Bible or having the Word of God. Wycliffe was born in a village in England around the 1320s. He rejected many of Rome's heresies, including the doctrine that laymen shouldn't have access to God's Word. He said the following, You say it is heresy to speak of the Holy Scriptures in English. You call me a heretic because I have translated the Bible into the common tongue of the people. Do you know whom you blaspheme? Did not the Holy Ghost give the word of God at first in the mother tongue of the nations to whom it was addressed? Why do you speak against the Holy Ghost? You say that the Church of God is in danger from this book. How can that be? Is it not from the Bible only that we learn that God has set up such a society as a church on the earth? Is it not the Bible that gives all her authority to the church? Is it not from the Bible that we learn who is the builder and sovereign of the church? What are the laws by which she is to be governed and the rights and privileges of her members? Without the Bible, what charter has the church to show for all these? It is you who place the church in jeopardy by hiding the divine warrant, the missive royal of her king, for the authority she wields and the faith she enjoins. He really did break the ground and uh, he was uh, persecuted for it. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he, he died natural death, but then later they dug up his bones and uh, burned them and then scattered the ashes into the Seine River. 
So he was a martyr, but after he was, uh, after his death. John Wycliffe wanted the common man to have access to the Bible, which ended up spurring a movement to mass produce Bibles and more translation works. Eventually, in 1453, the Ottoman Empire comes in, invades, takes over the Byzantine Empire. The city's collapse marked the end of the Middle Ages. And because of this collapse, a lot of people in this area fled into the Latin area. They fled into the western portion of Rome. Well, when they're fleeing, what do they take with them? They're Greek translations of the Bible. In 1516, Desiderius Erasmus published a Greek New Testament that was paralleled with the Latin text. This was done to highlight areas in which the Latin deviated and to show where it had been corrupted. Desiderius Erasmus is one who then wants to also give the Bible to the common people, but he doesn't want to just use the Latin. So Desiderius Erasmus says, you know what? The Bible was originally given to us in Greek. And then it was translated into Latin. But what if we go back to that Greek? Is it really lining up with our Latin? And so basically what he wanted to do is he wanted to provide people with a Latin and a Greek comparison. Conservative academics were beginning to realize that Greek was really the basis. That's what the Bible was written in. It was not written in Latin, it was written in Greek. So they began to realize that if you want to go to the source, you, you must do the Greek. You have a movement to go back and, and basically take the Bible back to the original Greek and Hebrew because the idea was that the Latin Bible was corrupt. That was the fear that the Catholic, if it's the Catholic Bible, then it must be corrupted because they want to stay in power. He was not going to use the Latin of the Catholic Church. He was actually going to use the Greek as the underlying source for the Latin. And so then when people would look at his Latin, they would say, this is different than the Latin of the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church had corrupted the Latin Bible and, and we don't know if we can trust it. Let's go back to the original languages and see what the Bible says in the original languages. Now, here's a quote from Erasmus. But one thing the facts cry out, and it can be clear, as they say, even to a blind man, that often through the translator's clumsiness or inattention, the Greek has been wrongly rendered. Often, the true and genuine reading has been corrupted by ignorant scribes, which we see happen every day, or altered by scribes who are half taught and half asleep. So according to Erasmus, he was saying, hey, the guys that gave us this Latin Bible and the Catholic Church, they're at best blind, clumsy, you know, half taught, half asleep. I mean, this guy did not have a high view of the translation work of the Latin. He printed right next to it a Greek and a Latin so that people could read the Greek and be like, whoa, this is different. Anybody that had any kind of knowledge, any kind of education. And the, and the why that was so authoritative is because everybody knew that the Greek had multiple manuscripts spread across the world all saying the same thing. So if it's disagreeing with the Greek, it's just not true. He probably used, it. it's estimated between five and 12 different manuscripts, which is just a few, and that's always a, been a criticism of his. But if he had picked up another five or six, chances are they'd have been the same text because the vast majority of the texts that are being uh, around are all of that text. He inspired a giant movement. And of course, one of the people that was mostly inspired by this was Martin Luther. In 1522, Martin Luther produced a German New Testament that relied on the Greek published by Erasmus. During the time that new translations were made from the Erasmus Greek New Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament was standardized by Daniel Bomberg's printed edition in 1524. Bomberg's Hebrew text served as the underlying Hebrew that was translated to English for the Old Testament of the King James Bible and its predecessors. You've got Daniel Bomberg producing a printed copy of the Hebrew Old Testament. So now you've got Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament being printed on the printing press in the 1500s. And so now these start getting translated into everyday languages. 
As the Word of God continued its journey going all the way back to the time of Moses, it was eventually translated into the lingua franca of the world. William Tyndale was used by God to translate the New Testament into modern English for the very first time in 1526. He laid the groundwork for the English Bibles that succeeded his work. Tyndale was a highly regarded scholar who was so fluent in eight languages, it was said that any one of them could have constituted his native tongue. He's frequently referred to as the architect of the English language. Tyndale loved what Luther was doing in Germany. He said, if I can do in England, if I can do in the English-speaking world what Luther did in Germany, we're going to change the world, and he did. He ended up printing a New Testament edition of the scriptures from the Greek. And so this is our first edition of the New Testament. 1526, we know he translated the Bible into the New Testament, excuse me, into English for the first time. That got him in all sorts of hot water. Price was put on his head. King was looking for him, bishops were looking for him, bounty hunters were looking for him. How dare you challenge church authority? Now, of course, you know who didn't like this? The Catholic Church. Now, William Tyndale is a fugitive and an outlaw because the, the Catholic Church was dominating in England at this time, and so it's not legal for the Word of God to just go free. He tried to get permission because you weren't allowed because of the Constitution of 1408. He wasn't allowed to translate anything into English. So he tried to go to the Archbishop and ask him if he could get permission. Well, he didn't get permission, so that's why he fled from England over to, the, uh, to Europe and there he found some uh, places for uh, hiding and he could start translating. And so in 1525, he began translating the Greek into English. And so he was able to translate the New Testament into modern English. So William Tyndale produced the first modern English translation of the Greek New Testament. William Tyndale, a brave man who fought against the Catholic Church, didn't want the Catholic Church to dominate the Bible and I wanted regular people to have it. Here's a quote from him. I perceived how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. William Tyndale said, I can't teach anybody any truth until they have the Bible in their language. Now, how true is that today? Because the Bible, uh, his Bible was forbidden in England, anything that came into England in Tyndale New Testament, they would destroy it, burn it, and so forth. So he began to smuggle uh, copies into England with uh, through bales of cotton and things like that. William Tyndale was printing a Bible into English against the authority of that time, the Catholic Church, and he was hunted down and he was literally killed for having given us a Bible in English. He lived in, in obscurity then while he was in, in Europe and was able to keep, uh, to keep hidden. But he was betrayed by someone who knew him and uh, they arrested him and charged him and then he was uh, burned at the stake in 1536. Strangled first and then burned at the stake. And he was tied to the stake and burned at the stake and in his dying breath he said, Lord! Open the King of England's eyes! While he, almost while he was praying that, Henry was changing his mind about the Eng an English Bible uh, for the people. Uh, it, it just almost seemed like God was actually answering that prayer right at that time. In 1535, Miles Coverdale continued Tyndale's work and created the Coverdale Bible, the very first modern English translation to contain both the Old and New Testament, making use of Luther's German text and the Latin Vulgate as sources. The 1537 Matthews Bible was published by John Rogers under the pseudonym Thomas Matthew. It was the first English Bible translated from the original Hebrew and Greek. The 1539 Great Bible became the first English translation authorized for public use as it was distributed to every church. It received its name due to its large size. In 1560, the Church of Geneva in Switzerland produced the Geneva Bible, 
the first to add numbered verses to each chapter, making it easier to reference specific passages. 1568, you have the Bishop's Bible. So you have this continual work, refining process of them going to the Greek, trying to work on this process. Instead of just one guy on the run by himself being hunted down, you have other people kind of picking up the torch. But a lot of times it was still just one guy or a handful of guys. Eight years later, you know it as the Bishop's Bible, that was done in 1568, another explosion. The Queen permitted the Archbishop of Canterbury, loved the Geneva Bible, didn't have a problem with it, read it at home, but the Bishop's Bible would be the Bible of the pulpit. And that's what they taught from. It was a beautiful text, wonderfully laid out. It was a kind of a prototype, both in translation and in printing format for what we know today as the famous King James Bible. In 1604, the Anglicans and Puritans hotly disagreed on which translation should be used. In an effort to address errors and establish unity, the suggestion was made for a new translation. So people are kind of divided. You got some people that want the Bishop's Bible. You got other people that want the Geneva Bible. And it's kind of two factions. So King James, when he comes to power, is given the suggestion that maybe we should just put in the work necessary to just make one definitive version of the Bible in English that we could all agree on. Instead of having some people who got the Geneva, some people who got the bishops, let's put in the work to have one definitive version. After seven years of rigorous work by 54 top scholars, the King James Bible was completed in 1611. In the introduction written by the translators, they refer to King James desiring one more English translation. They underscore the importance of the king's aspiration by quoting him as saying the following. That out of the original sacred tongues, together with comparing of the labors, both in our own and other foreign languages, of many worthy men who went before us, there should be one more exact translation of the holy scriptures into the English tongue. It was King James I, during the second year of his reign, who called for the Hampton Court Conference, a meeting designed to address Puritan complaints and resolve conflicts within the Church of England. When King James came to the throne, uh, there were hopes on the, both sides of the Roman Catholics as well as the Protestants because he was coming from Scotland, which had a Catholic background. His, his lineage had some Catholic background but he was uh, in charge of the Church of England, which was Protestant. So the Protestants thought he's gonna support them and the Catholics thought maybe he'd support them. And he disappointed both. The whole scripture is dictated by God's spirit, thereby, as by his lively word, to instruct and rule the whole church. At the ascent of the throne of King James, we have a controversy between Puritans and Anglicans over which Bible to use. Are we going to use the Geneva or are we going to use the bishops? Upon his uh, coronation or when he was uh, announced to be the king, a group of about a thousand came together, they called the Millennials, and they came together and they said, we want to reform the church. So the Hampton Court Conference was gathered in order to reform the church. It was at that conference that Puritan John Reynolds suggested to the king that a new English translation be commissioned. He moved His Majesty that there might be a new translation of the Bible because those which were allowed in the reigns of Henry VIII and Edward VI were corrupt and not answerable to the truth of the original. In July of 1604, King James of England wrote to Archbishop Richard Bancroft of Canterbury that he had appointed certain learned men to the number of 54 for the translating of the Bible. These men were the best biblical scholars and linguists of their day, 
The translators were organized into six groups and met respectively at Westminster, Cambridge, and Oxford. And then after the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, you see King James come down, and what does he do? He hires basically 50, 53 to 55 scholars. And then those guys are broken up into six committees. If you remember the committee names, you have the uh, Oxford one and Oxford two, Cambridge one, Cambridge two, and then the two down in London. And you had all of that work being supervised, so you had good check and balance. So he appointed these translators, and Bancroft was a real scholar, and so he insisted that uh, they had the very best scholars throughout all of England to do it. So they ended up getting 54 scholars, they took Calvinists and Puritans, they took the Church of England, many of their scholars, and they said, all of you guys have to work together, come together, and agree on the text. One of the translators is famous for speaking 15 modern languages and six ancient languages. I mean, this guy knows 21 languages. That's one guy. There's 54 guys. Lancelot Andrews, an English bishop and scholar, chaired the translating work for the King James Bible. Born in 1555 by the Tower of London, Andrews had an intimate knowledge of both modern and ancient languages, 21 in total. From Hebrew, Syriac, and Greek to Chaldee, Andrews was a linguistic savant who made use of his expertise to act as a general editor during the making of the King James. He also led the first Westminster Company, the group of translators tasked with Genesis to Second Kings. Now he became really the main uh, source of the translating. He was given uh, the commission to, to do the translating and, and oversee it and, and everything. So Andrews was a, really a great scholar and Bancroft was too, but uh, Andrews is considered the greatest of the scholars, yeah. The King James translators were some of the most distinguished scholars of their day. For example, William Bedwell was England's leading Arabist. Thomas Harrison was a heavyweight intellectual with daunting expertise in both Greek and Hebrew. He was known as the only translator in any of the translation groups whose prodigious learning rivaled that of Lancelot Andrews. Richard Brett was an expert in languages such as Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, and Ethiopic. Henry Seville was an astronomer who had translated early scientific and mathematical manuscripts. In addition, Seville was known for his mastery of the Greek language. Miles Smith was so familiar with ancient languages that some believed Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, and Arabic were as familiar to him as English. The translation companies included many acting and former Regis professors at their respective colleges, such as John Harding, the Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford, and William Thorne, a former Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford, John Perrin, the Regis Professor of Greek at Oxford, and John Harmer, a former Regis Professor of Greek at Oxford. The translators of the King James Bible were selected for their academic achievements rather than their doctrinal agreement. The King James translators, they weren't uniminded. They weren't one-minded. They had lots of scholarship with lots of passion, with lots of ideas. And at the same time, I think what they knew was that what they were going to produce would change the world. 54 top scholars, and they weren't all from one denomination or one faction because he didn't want it to be slanted doctrinally toward one group or another. So he's got Church of England guys, Puritan guys, people that are just more secular guys that just really love the language, and weren't really necessarily that religious. Author Gordon Campbell said, quote, the learning embodied in the men of these six companies is daunting. It is sometimes assumed that people in the 21st century know more than the benighted people of the 17th century, but in many ways, the opposite is true. I mean, some of these guys had, had read everything that had been ever written in Greek that was available in England at that time. They had read it. They'd read all of it. They didn't just stop at the Iliad and the Odyssey. And to think that a committee of 54 could come up with such a fantastic translation is really sort of unbelievable. The translators were given 15 rules to abide by. The first rule to the translators stated, quote, the ordinary Bible to be read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, 
to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. They had the Bishop's Bible, which is a complete Bible, a completed work, and they said, you can only alter this Bible as long as the original allows it. They're not starting from scratch, folks. They've already got the Bishop's Bible. And King James specifically told them in the instructions, don't just change it for no reason. If the Bishop's Bible is right, leave it alone. Only change it if it actually needs to be changed. The fifth rule stated, the division of the chapters to be altered either not at all or as little as may be, if necessity so require. Additionally, the rules to the translators called for no marginal notes at all to be affixed, but only for the explanation of the Hebrew or Greek words when necessary. At the time, the marginal notes for the Geneva Bible had caused some controversy, and some people in England had even confused them for the inspired words of God. King James wanted to curtail this from being a recurring issue. The eighth rule to the translators stated, Every particular man of each company to take the same chapter or chapters, and having translated or amended them severally by himself, where he thinketh good, all to meet together, confer what they have done, and agree for their parts what shall stand. In fact, every part of the translation was examined at least 14 times, with some parts totaling 15 or 17 times depending on the complexity of the scripture. One of the tasks that they did is after they would translate a portion of the scripture, they would have one guy sit there and read it out loud in English, the King James Bible, and they'd have the other guys reading in different languages. So they would have the Spanish, they'd have the French, they would have the German, and they were making sure that it lined up with even all the foreign language works that were done, lining up with the Greek, lining up with all of the scriptures, that it even sounded good to the ear. And so they're sitting here and doing this for years and years and years, and finally, they produced the King James Bible. They had the bishops before them, and they looked at the bishops, and then they, they translated it. And that would be the first form, but you can bet that they were using the, the Old Testament, uh, Bamberg's uh, Old Testament, Hebrew and the Erasmus Greek New Testament. The King James translators utilized revised editions of the Erasmus, Biza, and Stephanus Greek New Testaments, along with the Daniel Bomberg Hebrew Old Testament. In the New Testament, the King James Bible is translated 100% from the Greek. Which Greek? They were using printed editions of the Greek New Testament that were published by Erasmus, Stephanus, and Biza. They primarily used Biza's edition, and there are some very slight, very minor, very few differences between Biza and Stephanus. So sometimes they went with Biza, sometimes they went with Stephanus. But again, the difference between these two is very minuscule. And so the Greek underlying the King James Bible is not any one of those printed editions, but rather it's drawn from that whole family of printed editions of the Textus Receptus. So you have a guy in 1894 named Scrivener who published a Greek text that basically takes Biza's text and Stephanus' text and just basically marries them into one text based on what the King James Bible translators use. Some people will wrongly say, oh, it's back translated from the King James. It's not back translated into Greek. It's just basically a synthesis of Stephanus and Biza to basically give us exactly the Greek that went into the King James New Testament. But what we all see in common is, is that the Greek, that Luther, Tyndale, the Geneva Committee, all of the foreign language committees, and then the King James committees, they all shared the same Greek, so things are going to read very similar. The KJV translators wrote, quote, Truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one. It had started with Tyndale. He had lots of limitations to work with. To start with when you're on the move, because they'd like to kill you, that makes sitting down and doing the work. They, they'd been through a process and uh, there was a purification process in it. The King James Bible process really starts in 1526 with Tyndale. They wanted one more, their words, 
exact translation. They wanted to finish the process. You know, an, an illustration that I was thinking of is when you look at how copper is mined from the earth and refined, it's pulled from the earth and then it's refined at a certain plant to get it 90%. Then they send it to another plant to get it to 99%. And then they send it to another plant whose only job is to take it from 99 to 99.9. .9. Okay, because that's a big step right there. And so that's what the King James Bible is. The Bishop's Bible was already 99% and the King James Bible translators are taking a good translation and making it a great translation. In 1611, after seven years of arduous work, the King James Bible project was finished and ready to be published. The completed work featured a title page that read, quote, the Holy Bible containing the Old Testament and the New, newly translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special commandment, appointed to be read in churches, imprinted at London by Robert Barker, printer to the King's Most Excellent Majesty. Led by Dr. Thomas Paris of Trinity College in Cambridge, the 1762 edition of the King James Bible standardized spelling based on Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language. In 1769, Dr. Benjamin Blaney of Oxford further refined the Paris KJV, essentially finishing what he started. The 1769 edition also corrected printer errors and modernized spelling. In 1769, we finally had the Oxford Standard which essentially established the spellings and a lot of these printing errors, and we have the Bible that we have today. I mean, if you have a King James Bible in your lap today, you basically have a 1769 copy. That's what it's like. It's virtually the exact same, okay? So you say, well, how do we get the Bible? We went from Moses to Jeremiah to Jesus to the apostles, to the apostle Paul, to Jerome, to Wycliffe, to Tyndale, all the way up to the Bishop's Bible, to the King James Bible, to the Blaley 1769, to the modern Bible I have in my hand right now as the Word of God being preserved through all ages. It's very important for us to believe that the Bible is inspired by God and was delivered by God. But equally as important is for us to believe in the doctrine of preservation, that God has providentially preserved the inspired words of God all the way from the time of Moses to the Bible we have today. The Bible itself is the final authority. There's no greater authority that we could appeal to outside of the Bible and say, oh, well, I believe the Bible because of science, or I believe the Bible because of history, because the, you know, those things would then become the final authority. The Bible itself is the final authority, and the Bible claims to be the inspired, preserved Word of God. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But the doctrine of inspiration is completely worthless without the doctrine of preservation. I believe every Christian, every so-called Christian out there um, would argue that the originals were inspired. Everybody virtually believes that. Um, but it's very few that believe in the preservation of scripture. It's no use to me to believe that the original manuscripts were inspired by God if they've ceased to exist and I don't have, I don't have them. Most doctrinal statements will start off with a statement generally stating they believe that the originals were inspired by God, God delivered and handed down his word to man. What good is that if we don't still have the words that God originally gave us? Yeah, yeah there's nothing wrong with that statement as long as it doesn't end right there. And you have to go on and describe what God has done after that. Because if God didn't do anything after that to keep his word in front of us, your answer, what good is it? Virtually none. If it's inspired by God, then it has to be preserved by God in order for that inspiration to mean anything to me today. What would be the point of God 
giving us his word, you know, over 1,500 years, multiple writers, different countries, different continents, different languages, and uh, use men to inspire his word and then allow it to be corrupted when it needed to be translated or when it needed to be uh, rewritten, obviously documented. The, the, the physical originals uh, do not exist anymore. So in order for us to continue to have the Bible, those had to be copied. And when people say, well, as soon as they began to be copied or began to be translated, there was mistakes and we lost the original, the Word of God, then it would just be a big waste of time for God to even give it to us to begin with. The Bible tells us that uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we wouldn't be able to function as Christians or have church practices or know what the Bible says about doctrine if we didn't have it in our specific language. So that's why I believe the doctrine of preservation is important and it's a biblical concept. More important than your food is the Bible. And God certainly preserved food, but you know what's more important is the Bible that He preserved for us today. To consume. We need to consume food daily, but we need to consume the spiritual food the spiritual manna on a regular basis. And of course, God wants to give us the organic version. He doesn't want to give us the GMO. He doesn't want to give us the corrupted version of the Word of God, but He wants us to have the holy and the pure words. God has promised that His Word would always be available to men. He didn't promise it would be everywhere. He didn't promise it would be in every language, but He promised it would always be available. And I know that's controversial among some of the brethren. They try to get away from that. But uh, some of the independent Baptists, half of the independent Baptists would say, you know, God never promised to preserve his word. It's, you know, we've got his doctrines and his ideas. But is there a line in the Bible that even twisted and turned would ever say that? God, you know, well, you, you may not always have my words, but you always have my doctrines. You may not always have my words, but you always have my content. Where is there a verse you can even twist to that? Would you say that? only the concepts are preserved, or you think that God actually preserved the words? Well, that's what it says here. God promised to preserve His words. And, 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 and I believe He has done it. Uh, it is not the concept. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. If God promised to preserve His words. So I believe we have a promise from God that His word is always available to man. The doctrine of preservation was made apparent historically by the diffusion of God's Word throughout the ages. But the concept is also apparent biblically. Scripture makes it clear in multiple places that God promised to preserve His Word. So look at where you are there in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 21. The Bible says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So there's a promise given in the book of Isaiah saying not only are your children going to say my words, not only are your grandchildren going to say my words, but from every generation, from henceforth, and forever we're all going to have the book of Isaiah. He said the word that was inspired in the days of Isaiah, the preaching that Isaiah did where he spoke the words of God and said, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord made a covenant, he made a promise, he made an agreement, he gave a guarantee that that word would continue to exist from here on out and forever. Isaiah, the Bible says, now go and write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Isaiah saying, hey, the Bible is forever. Every time the scripture mentions his word, it mentions it using terms like forever or forever and forever or a thousand generations or heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Well, the Bible says forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So we know that God's word has obviously always existed. Well, you can take a verse like in Proverbs where it says, every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That's talking present tense and including 
scriptures that are much older. If we're not allowed to add to God's word, then we must have it in order to even be able to add to it. It would make no sense if we didn't have it, and he says, don't add to this, when you don't even have access to it. When we think about David saying in the Psalms, the law of the Lord is perfect. He's speaking several hundred years after the law was first given at Mount Sinai. And so we have all of these verses in the present tense talking about how God's word is pure. God's word is clean. The Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the Bible specifically tells us that it is God's job, it is his task to preserve his word. Just as God preserves his word for this generation and the next generation, for every generation, he's also gonna preserve the poor that trust in him. He's gonna preserve mankind and both are gonna be preserved forever and so he gives us these great words to illustrate that God's word is never going to cease to exist. And if you read the whole chapter, it's the main emphasis is the word of God against the word of man. And God promised to preserve his word uh, forever. Why would I think that God only wanted a small subset of human population to have had the word of God? Why would I not think that it's just as important today for us as mankind to have the Bible. When there's so many more people, so many more souls, so much more opportunity for the word of God to be heard and to be preached and for faith to be exercised. You know, God's not a respecter of persons and he didn't decide that those of our fathers, those of antiquity could have the Bible and we get scraps, but rather he decided, you know what? All generations. It's God's providential hand that preserves the word of God and he puts it in the hearts of man to carry out his work. You know, you think of salvation, for example, God is, is essentially doing the bulk of the work because he's the one who's saving the soul, but he uses human instruments to carry out that work. Matthew 5 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Jesus went so far as to say that not even a jot or tittle would pass until the entire earth had passed away one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. And so heaven and earth are still here, then God's word must still be preserved. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse eight, the Bible teaches providential preservation by promising that, quote, the word of our God shall stand forever. The Bible also contains more evidence for this doctrine in the book of Psalms. For example, Psalm 3311 says, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Psalm 119 verse 152 says, Concerning thy testimonies I have known of old, that thou hast founded them forever. Psalm 119 verse 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. A reasonable person can track how scribes and other workers throughout the work of God's providence kept His word intact. I do not blush or feel ashamed saying that I believe God has and was able to give truth to each generation in some way. While ease and access are better than it's ever been, there's always been God's preserved word. It didn't just appear in 1611 or 1844. It's always been here. I'm thankful for the accurate translation. I'm thankful that I have, I have a Bible that I don't believe there's an error in. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's saying that the word of God is alive. It's, it's somewhere. You know, how can we say that the Bible's living if, if it doesn't even exist? You know, if it doesn't even exist, if it's nowhere, we don't have it, then it doesn't really make it very alive. You know what makes the Bible alive is the fact that it's everywhere. I mean, think about it. The Word of God, the King James Bible is the most printed book in human history. It's the most read book in human history. I mean, this thing is alive, folks. This thing is everywhere. And you know how long it's gonna be alive forever? The Bible is saying that God's Word will stick around forever. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, 
but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The word of God is not grass that sprung up in the Bible times, sprung up during the New Testament, and then somewhere around the first, second, third, fourth, fifth century, somewhere the lawnmower came and chopped it up, and, and now we need these scholars and experts and archaeologists to kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again because it's somehow been damaged. Folks, God's word ain't broke, so don't try to fix it. We don't need to reconstruct the original text because we never stopped having God's word in the traditional text. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and he was dead for three days, but you know what? God preserved his physical body because the Bible says his flesh did not see corruption. And if God can preserve the physical body of Jesus Christ in the grave and revive it out of the grave, then just in the same manner, God can preserve his word and we can see no corruption. Just like his body saw no corruption, I believe that the word of God, we have it today and we can look at it and say, you know what, this has no corruption either. For 270 years, the King James Bible stood on its own as the standard English translation of Scripture. It was once referred to simply as the authorized version or the Holy Bible, as it was unmatched in terms of usage and popularity. But a new philosophy emerged in the 1800s based on unused manuscripts, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, that introduced a new method of textual criticism. The reason why the King James Bible started to be challenged again after just hundreds of years of being the only mainstream version, the only reason it got challenged was a whole new philosophy emerging in the 19th century, a philosophy that said we've lost the text and we have to reconstruct it. We must do archaeology and, and we have to go back and find older manuscripts and, and we need to do textual criticism all over again and figure out what the Bible says because the traditional text is corrupt. What we need to do is reconstruct the, what, what our best understanding is of the Greek New Testament. We're talking about manuscript-based textual criticism. We're, we're actually talking about trying to reconstruct the original text based upon earlier manuscripts than any other work of antiquity, better manuscripts than any other work wow. of antiquity, okay? What we try to reconstruct is the text from which the surviving witnesses descend. And this idea that we have to reconstruct the text is operating under the assumption that we've lost the text. Whereas we don't believe it's lost. We believe we've always had the Bible. We don't need to go dig it up somewhere. Do people who use a critical text, do they think that they have a perfect, inerrant Bible? Or are they gonna constantly work towards that? No, they don't believe they have a perfect Bible. They know it and they confess it publicly. They said that every Bible has mistakes. That's what they say. That's what they believe. New versions of the Bible are constantly being published in an effort to get closer to what is presumed as the original manuscript. Since critical text proponents believe that older manuscripts are more reliable, they're willing to constantly update the text with any new discoveries. One of these critical text proponents was a man by the name of Constantin von Tischendorf. He went on a quest to find such manuscripts that are older. And he ended up finding a manuscript known as Codex Sinaiticus. This is arguably one of the most significant discoveries in modern textual criticism. And in fact, many modern Bibles rely on the readings of Codex Sinaiticus. In 1844, Constantin von Tischendorf initially discovered portions of Codex Sinaiticus in a Catholic monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. In visiting the library of the monastery in the month of May 1844, I perceived in the middle of the great hall a large and wide basket full of old parchments, and the librarian, who was a man of information, 
told me that two heaps of papers like this, molded by time, had been already committed to the flames. What was my surprise to find amid this heap of papers a considerable number of sheets of a copy of the Old Testament in Greek, which seemed to me to be one of the most ancient that I had ever seen. The authorities of the convent allowed me to possess myself of a third of these parchments, or about 45 sheets, all the more readily as they were destined for the fire. In a subsequent visit in 1859, Tischendorf found the entire Codex Sinaiticus, which would later be used by Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort to produce the critical text. In 1881, Westcott and Hort produced the Greek New Testament from which modern versions of the Bible have been translated. It's known as the critical text, and it's based on the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts. Since then, the United Bible Society, along with Eberhard Nestle and Kurt Allen, have updated the work of Westcott and Hort, as archaeologists have unearthed more Egyptian manuscripts. Today, the nestle allen Greek New Testament is on its 28th edition, with future revisions on the horizon. In their own words, Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort said, All distinctively Syrian readings must be at once rejected. Fenton Hort practically lambasted the received text when he referred to it as, quote, villainous in his writings. He also said, quote, think of the vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a blessing there are such early ones. Another editor of the modern critical text, Kurt Allen, considers Greek manuscripts which are purely or predominantly Byzantine to be, quote, irrelevant for textual criticism. These sentiments represent the new philosophy of critical text advocates. They believe Egyptian manuscripts unearthed in the 19th century are more reliable than the traditional received text of scripture. We've now got a better manuscript, and so they produced new versions of the Bible like the NASB, the NIV, etc. It's anything but the King James Version. We have found older copies of the original writings of scripture since the King James Version was done. There's more scholarship. And so those blessed scholars didn't have the resources that we have today, and so they didn't make all the adaptation. Critical text proponents believe older manuscripts are, in the vast majority of cases, better. However, this ignores the many credible reasons why older manuscripts may not necessarily be more reliable. People often bring up the argument that, well, Older manuscripts are always better because they're just old. The general reality is that the text that we can obtain from the year 200 from the papyri has a better chance of being traceable directly to the apostolic period than if all you had was the text of Byzantine manuscripts from the year 1200. The earlier is better is a generally true statement with exceptions that we know about, exceptions that we can document, exceptions that we go, oh, hey, look at this. And the reason that we know those other exceptions is because we have earlier manuscripts to compare them with. Scholarship has agreed on, on one thing, and that is the versions of the Bible that were written closer to the first century are by default more reliable. And let me explain why I don't believe that older is better in this particular argument. Number one, it was not being used. It's important to consider that manuscripts actually being used will wear out. In contrast, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, along with other papyri fragments that have been discovered over the years, were not being used throughout history and passed down from generation to generation. This explains why archaeologists are still able to discover manuscripts that fall under the Alexandrian tradition even today, and why they tend to be older. The Greek text underlying the King James Bible has often been known as the received text or textus receptus because it's that which we received. It's been passed down. It's the traditional text that's been used by Christians throughout history. The modern versions are based on a completely different philosophy where they've unearthed or discovered 
older texts that nobody was using. So these are texts that had been abandoned, texts that had been discarded. But they dug these things up and said, well, these are older, therefore they must be more reliable. For example, the, the received texts, these are manuscripts that were actually used and read in actual churches. And so people are, you know, pastors are preaching from them, uh, congregants are using them, Christians, you know, are utilizing the Word of God, so through wear and tear, they would have to copy it again and copy it again and copy it again. I've got my King James Bible that I use, I read. This one, this is the one that's going to get worn out, you know? If you grab an NIV or an ESV that I've got here just as a, as a tool to show what's wrong with it, it's in pretty good condition because I'm not reading it. And so these are actually Bibles that are being used, whereas the older manuscripts, they're preserved because no one's using them. If someone uses a Bible, the Bible that you use on daily reading, is that going to wear out quicker than perhaps a Bible you have on your shelf? Absolutely, this why, this why the older Bibles, because they were put on the shelf. Number two reason why older is not better is the location, the location. And some people would make a big deal about the fact that, you know, the King James Bible is kind of coming from the Byzantine Empire, which of course, if we think about it, Christianity is really getting kick-started in Antioch. It's getting kick-started in that part of the world. So it makes more sense that manuscripts are going to be better in the areas where Christianity is being formed. And of course, the letters themselves are written to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, to the Corinthians. So it makes more sense that that origin or that source is going to have a better text. In total, about 5,800 extant or existing Greek manuscripts are available today, and they're divided into several text types or forms. The two most significant are the Byzantine text type and the Alexandrian text type. The Byzantine text type originated in Antioch, Syria, where the disciples of Christ were first called Christians in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. This family represents 99% of all known Greek manuscripts that largely agree with each other. Meanwhile, the Alexandrian text type originated in Alexandria, Egypt, and represents a small minority of all existing manuscripts. The received text of scripture, or the Textus Receptus, the underlying Greek for the King James, is based on Byzantine manuscripts. Conversely, the Greek underlying modern Bible translations such as the NIV or ESV is based on newly discovered manuscripts from the Alexandrian tradition. But even more important than the location being just geographic, you know, instead of being in Egypt or in the Vatican, they're in the parts where Christianity was at. How about just the immediate location? One's in a trash can and the other one is in the hands of Christians. Some critical text proponents will lie about the location of where certain manuscripts have been discovered. Specifically, Codex Sinaiticus, critical text proponent James White has often lied saying that it's not been found near or in a trash can when it most certainly has been. And in fact, I did want to correct just one misapprehension. Sinaiticus was not found in or near a trash can. That is a common <laughs> myth, but it's untrue. All you have to do is read Constantine von Tischendorf's own first-hand account of his discovery of the manuscript. A monk brought it out of the closet of the cell wrapped in red cloth. Folks, people in, in monasteries do not wrap garbage in red cloths, okay? James White does accurately describe in Constantine Tischendorf's account of finding Codex Sinaiticus that a steward handed him the parchments in a red cloth. But what James White fails to state is how those same parchments were previously discovered by Constantine in a basket, and if he had not, those parchments would have been destined for the flames. I unrolled the cover and discovered, to my great surprise, not only those very fragments which 15 years before I had taken out of the basket, but also other parts of the Old Testament, the New Testament complete, and in addition, the epistle of Barnabas and a part of the pastor of Hermas. Not only did Constantine find Codex Sinaiticus at this time, according to his account, he also found other documents such as the Epistle of Barnabas. I knew that I held in my hand the most precious biblical treasure in existence, a document whose age and importance exceeded that of 
all the manuscripts which I had ever examined during 20 years' study of the subject. I cannot now, I confess, recall all the emotions which I felt in that exciting moment, with such a diamond in my possession. Though my lamp was dim and the night cold, I sat down at once to transcribe the Epistle of Barnabas. You know, James White seems to leave that out too, doesn't he? Tischendorf appeared to be most excited about the fraudulent Epistle of Barnabas, which he discovered along with the Sinaiticus manuscript. But he's just saying, like, I found the greatest document, the greatest treasure that you've, we've ever discovered, the Epistle of Barnabas. <laughs> I'm just like, what in the world? This guy doesn't even care about this, the Codex Sinaiticus. He cares about this apocryphal book, about this trash document, and he gets so excited. And of course, this is the man that basically leads Westcott and Hort and all of the modern critical texts and all the Bibles that you have today. Sinaiticus, which was previously discarded, has been largely used to produce the various editions of the critical text. In addition to Sinaiticus, even newer discoveries of abandoned and unused manuscripts have been found buried in the earth. But the question is, why were they buried in the first place? It's worth noting that there's an established tradition amongst Jews where they discard certain manuscripts. They bury them. Even today, Torahs are buried underground either due to deterioration or a slew of scribal errors. Rabbi Miroff is the first to pick up a shovel. One by one, members of the congregation, young and old, join him in digging the dirt to fill the grave. What do the Jews actually do? You know what the Jews do? They think since the Bible's living, they say it's a real person, so it needs to be buried. So often what Jews will do is they'll take their manuscripts that have problems, errors, and mistakes, and they'll bury them. This practice still happens today. Yeah, basically, if there's one mistake, even one letter is partially rubbed out or whatever, then the whole Torah is no good. So and if it's out of place, they gotta go back and fix it. They have to stop using it until it's being fixed, and the okay. Torah that cannot be fixed has to be buried. Now think about this. If, if the Jews have been doing the same things for centuries, Stands the reason that they may have been doing this burying practice back at the time of Christ or even before Christ. So if I find a bunch of manuscripts that have been buried, who's to say that they weren't all the bad versions of the Bible? They weren't all the bad scrolls that they had made the mistakes, had worn out, had problems, and they had buried them. And then when we unearth them, they're all the trash versions. They're all the versions that had the mistake and all the problems to begin with. So manuscripts that Christians rejected in the, in, you know, in, in the first century, second century, third century are now being pulled out and we're being told that we have to accept it. If I find an older manuscript that's been buried in the earth, that sounds way worse to me than a new manuscript that was in the hands of Christians. If we believe that God preserved his word and that it's been preserved throughout the generations, then we would not go seek a Bible that's been buried. And, and have to go rediscover the Bible because we don't believe the Bible was ever lost. You have to believe that God inspired and preserved his word, otherwise God just wasted his time. And if you're going to take the position that, no, these manuscripts that have been dug up or that have been found, um, and these are now the actual word of God and we need to go back and, and fix what we've had, then you're believing that the word of God was lost and that is not compatible with God. Here's the third reason I don't believe that older is necessarily better, is the integrity of the document. When we talk about these older manuscripts, they're, they're not finding the complete Bible. They're not even finding complete books of the Bible. If you go and you look at these actual documents, they will say, oh, here's, here's part of the Bible. And it'll be like this big, and it'll have like a few letters that you can barely read on. They're finding uh, fractions and pieces, and specifically when it comes to the critical text, there are major portions that are missing. Um, there are, uh, we're told that as you look at these documents, they're, they're even scribbled on and written on 10 different authors. They can uh, tell that have made changes to it and things like that. So it's not like they just found a complete Bible from the first century and they're now telling us, well, this is actually the right one. Um, they are finding fragments and trying to use that 
to really attack the Bible that we've had um, since the Lord Jesus Christ, since the New Testament. You know, you look at these documents, they have holes in them, they have scribbles, they're written over, they're missing sections, and they don't agree with one another. Yet they have one, they're older. It's like, we're gonna ignore the use, we're gonna ignore the location, we're gonna ignore the integrity of the document, because it's older. Textual critics believe that older manuscripts are more reliable, therefore the application is uncertain. Would they change the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Greek, the Hebrew? Well, in an effort to find out, we interviewed one of the translators for the Holman Christian Standard Bible, Dr. James Allman. Dr. Allman is a experienced student of Greek and Hebrew, and he had translated a portion of the Psalms. He's a very nice man, he's a dedicated Christian, and we asked him if he would be willing to update the Hebrew if we found older discoveries, or even specifically with the Dead Sea Scrolls, if you'd be willing to update the Masoretic text. And he made it very clear that he would be willing to update the text. If you were reading in Hebrews chapter one, you have the line, let all the angels of God praise him. Uh, and your, your Bible may have a cross-reference to Deuteronomy 32. You won't find it in your Bible. It's not in the Masoretic text, but it is in the Qumran scroll of Deuteronomy. <laughs> so we're able to restore some things that, that the New Testament treated as Old Testament quotations, but we can't identify them. So, so we're able to, to correct that. So if we found more ancient evidence, would that be added in, in your opinion? Yeah. Dr. Allman's willingness to change the text illustrates how critical text proponents do not believe we have a preserved Bible. And in fact, with new discoveries, they would potentially change any verse in the Bible. But based on your method, if there were a discovery of ancient documents that most scholars agreed what, what makes this the earliest reading, you would be willing to change your position on any text within the New Testament based on evidence that might be uncovered. Is that correct? Yes. Those who believe in the modern versions, a new archeological discovery could completely revolutionize their view of God's work to the point where they would completely change their Bible. There's no question that the critical text differs both philosophically and substantively from the received text. They're based on different manuscripts and consequently, they disagree with each other thousands of times. In 1876, the Dean of Chichester College, John Burgeon, a native Greek speaker and in his time a world-renowned expert on Greek Bible manuscripts, was able to examine both the Vatican and the Sinaitic text to compare them both to the received text. These were his findings. In the Gospels alone, Vaticanus is found to omit at least 2,877 words, to add 536, to substitute 935, to transpose 2,098, to modify 1,132, in all 7,578 changes. The corresponding figures for Sinaiticus were 3,455 words omitted, 839 added, 1,114 substituted, 2,299 transposed, 1,265 modified, and in all 8,972 changes. Either somebody's taken a lot out or somebody's putting a lot in. And both of those processes are forbidden to us in Scripture. We're not to subtract a word or to add a word. It's not like there's just, oh, well, here it uses one word and here it's using another word and those words mean the same thing. Uh, there are major issues between these, two, these different Bibles uh, to the point where they both can't be right. 
Now, here's the question. Which one's right? Because they can't both be the Bible, folks. Since modern Bibles are based on a completely different underlying text than that of the King James and its predecessors, it necessarily follows that modern Bibles say something different. If you compare a King James Bible to an NIV, you're going to notice that whole verses are removed from the Bible. And I'm saying like they're just completely gone. There's 16 whole verses just taken out of the Bible. Like Matthew 17, verse 21, gone. Matthew 18, 11, gone. Matthew 23, verse 14, gone. Mark 7, verse 16, gone. Mark 9, verse 44, gone. Mark 9, 46, gone. Mark 11, 26, gone. Mark 15, 28, gone. Luke 17, 36, gone. Luke 23, 17, gone. John 5, 4, gone. Acts 8, 37, gone. Acts 15, 34, gone. Acts 24, 7, gone. Acts 28, 29, gone. Romans 16, 24, gone. And I'm not saying like parts of it, I'm saying the whole thing just ripped out. The New International Version, otherwise known as the NIV, removes 16 entire verses, including familiar passages such as Mark chapter 9, verse 44, which says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And in verse 46, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Who would want to say that hell is not a place of eternal punishment? Maybe the people going to hell? Maybe people that don't want to scare you about hell because then you might actually believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved? You know what? The Bible teaches that people should be afraid of God and afraid of hell. And you know what strikes terror in people's heart is hearing where the fire is never going to be quenched. Not just gone. Here's some other verses that are just completely gone. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Why would you want to take that verse out? Frankly speaking, if you get an NIV today and you go to Mark chapter 16, you kind of get to verse 8. Usually they'll put a buffer between verse 8 and verse 9 that'll say, oh, some manuscripts don't contain this latter portion of Mark. And they'll basically just put this dividing line where they just separate from the two. The two most reliable early manuscripts do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So it's like you're reading in the Bible and then just, as you're just reading in the text, it'll just randomly just say that. Just have a big break and then just be like, oh, hint, hint, the most reliable, ma what makes them reliable? Oh, are we talking about Sinaiticus, which was found in a trash can? Is that the reliable Bible? The one that was found that was destined for the fire? There's a verse in Mark chapter 16 that I quote all the time, and, and frankly speaking, I think it's one of the most important verses. Look what it says in verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, that's the only time the Bible says verbatim that we're supposed to go and preach to every creature. Am I really supposed to think it's any coincidence that the devil would want to take that verse out of the Bible? They want to destroy that verse. And you know what? There's a lot of people that say, oh, we're not supposed to go out and evangelize. We make disciples. Well, let me tell you something. More important than making disciples is going out and preaching the gospel. And to every creature. And you know what? I know why the devil wants to take that verse out of the Bible. Because of how powerful it is for us to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. What's sad about the critical text position is how they put so much doubt on the word of God, even to their own loved ones. And when we talked with Dr. James Allman, he expressed to us that even his own wife was incredulous to the fact that Mark 16 wasn't really the scripture. Mark 16, I, my, my wife, even after all the years she sat under my teaching, said, do you mean to tell me that part of the Bible is not the Bible? Why would you trust someone to translate the New Testament for you who rejects the story of the woman taken in adultery, who rejects the ending of Mark 16, who believes in a gospel of Mark that ends with them being scared and not telling anybody. It doesn't even make sense. And, and I've, I've preached about how if you take out nine through 20, the ending doesn't make sense and it becomes a lie is what it becomes. And so that ending at verse eight is absurd. But just keep in mind that even though they printed verses nine through 20, 
they told you in the column that they don't believe in it. So not only are they removing whole verses 16 times, not only are they removing verses through footnotes to combine to over 40 verses, not only are they taking out whole phrases where you're going to get into hundreds, then they take verses that are still there and twist them to say something completely different. Proverbs chapter 16, look at verse 10. A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment. Here's what it says in the New King James. Divination is on the lips of the king. So according to the Bible, divination is condemned as a satanic practice of witchcraft. The modern versions are adding Satanism into the Bible, falsely accusing the king and ultimately the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18, verse 8. The words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. The New King James, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. The New American Standard Bible, the NASB, the words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels. What does the NIV say? The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. Who's gonna sit here and argue that gossip is a good thing? Verse 24, the King James says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. NIV, in this verse, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. Here's what the North American Standard Bible, or the NASB says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. How, the, the King James Bible is telling you to be friendly, to have lots of friends. The NASB is telling you don't have a lot of friends. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Listen to what it says in the NIV. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. You know, it doesn't contain these weird, strange readings is the Textus Receptus Bibles. And what I want to illustrate for you today is how when you read the Bible in the Tyndale, and then you read the Bible in the Bishops, and then you read the Bible in the King James, you're going to notice it's the same, same, same. And then you get to the NIV, different. Then you get the NLT, different. So it's like, hey, every Bible has the same verse, same verse, same verse, gone. Same verse, same verse, same verse, completely different. Why? Because the modern versions are not the same Bible. Mark chapter 10, look at verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Listen to what it says in the NIV. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. The King James says for those that trust in riches. This one's just saying it's hard to get into heaven. Well, it might be hard to get into heaven if you're reading an NIV, but it's not if you're reading the King James. The NASB, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, just to illustrate for you how this is so different, let me read for you Mark 10, verse 24 in the Tyndale New Testament. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Let me read in the bishops. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. So we see in the Tyndale, for those that trust in riches, we see in the bishops, for those who trust in riches, we see in the King James, for those that trust in riches, modern versions, gone. They just completely removed that. Why? Because it's the same, 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 different. Showing that this isn't a translation work coming on top of the King James, it's a completely different source. It's changing the Bible and it's making it more difficult. Now in John chapter seven, we have a story about the Lord Jesus Christ and his integrity and character is questioned by the modern versions. But look what it says, John chapter seven, verse number eight, go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast for my time is not yet full come. So Jesus Christ is saying, hey, I'm not gonna go up yet, meaning I'm not going up with you right now. But that doesn't mean he's not gonna go up later. Listen to what it says in the NIV. You go to the festival, I am not going up to this festival. The NIV just says he's not going. Now wait a minute, two verses later, even in the NIV, it's gonna say he went up. 
What would that make you if you say, I'm not going to this party, and then you went? That would make you a liar. Let me read for you the Tyndale. Go ye up unto this feast. I will not go up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Bishops, go ye up unto this feast. I will not go up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. So Tyndale, it's yet. Bishop, it's yet. King James, it's yet. Modern versions, I'm not going. So they just create a lie in the text. Why didn't they have the word yet there? Because they're corrupting the text. Because they're trying to make Jesus Christ a liar. 1 John 5, 7, completely removed in the modern versions, for there are three that testify. Let me read for you 1 John 5, 7. You can turn there if you want. In the Tyndale it says this, for there are three which bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, the bishops. For there are three which bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Modern versions, there are three that testify. It's just gone, folks. It's not the same Bible. It's not the same book. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed unto the world, received up into glory. Here's what it says in the ESV. He was manifest in the flesh. Well, who's he? Why did they take it out? Why does it not say God anymore? What does it say in the Tyndale? God was showed in the flesh. What does it say in the bishops? God was showed in the flesh. What does it say in the King James? God was manifest in the flesh. Why are they taking that verse out? Why are they changing God with he? Because they want to strip away the deity of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the King James Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but in us which are saved, it is the power of God. New King James, this is what it says, but to us who are being saved, NIV, but to us who are being saved, NASB, but to us who are being saved. So in the modern versions, it doesn't say you are saved, it says you're being saved. You know what it says in the Tyndale? but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You wanna know what it says in the bishops? But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. How come it's saying the exact same thing and then all of a sudden it's just completely different? They wanna strip away the deity of Jesus Christ. They wanna strip away all the power, all the wisdom. They wanna make the Bible sound foolish. Not only that, they also wanna take away the hate out of the Bible. Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Here's what the ESV says. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Oops, they forgot something. Which thing I hate. Now, let me read for you in the Tyndale. Even so hast thou them that maintain the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Here's the bishops. Even so hast thou them that maintain the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So we have the Tyndale, the bishops, and the King James all saying the same thing. And then we have the modern versions just taking old phrases out again. 1526, Tyndale right here. And uh, if it wasn't for the text being formed a little different, you wouldn't have much trouble reading that and it matches the King James about 85% of the time. Which for a starter translation by one man who's fleeing persecution was an incredible job. Well, and again, the difference between a Tyndale and a King James, most of the variations are gonna be word order, sentence structure, as opposed to taking phrases out. Yes, that's correct. It is based on the same text. It has the same words. The versions that came before the King James pretty much said the same thing as the King James, whereas these modern versions are saying something dramatically different. I mean, the difference between the Bishop's Bible and the King James Bible is very small, whereas the difference between the King James Bible and the NIV is a giant leap. Those are not even comparable. It's apples to oranges. NIV will remove whole phrases from the Bible in Luke 4, 4. The Bible says that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. NIV, gone. It just takes out every word of God. You know why I know the NIV is not every word of God? It removes the phrase, every word of God. 
The modern versions of the Bible have clearly changed the text from the King James Bible, not in an effort to refine the text, but rather they've constantly updated it to say something completely different. Therefore, our church is King James only because we believe that the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved words of God. If someone rejects the King James Bible, they're not just rejecting the King James Bible, but they're rejecting the bishops, they're rejecting the Tyndale, they're rejecting all the preceding English translations, they're rejecting the Greek, and they're rejecting the Hebrew that gave us the King James Bible. Unfortunately, some King James only advocates will claim that the King James Bible is superior to the underlying Greek or superior to the underlying Hebrew. They're known as Ruckmanites. These people do not believe that God providentially preserved the scripture through translation, but rather God had to re-inspire the translators, which is known as double inspiration. The new philosophy behind the modern translations of the Bible is not the only method to undermine the preservation of scripture. Another new philosophy exists within fundamentalism that conflicts with preservation. Ruckmanism. And if you were to modernize, you know, uh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If you were to change that to I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me, which the modern Bibles do, mm -hmm. I'm going to reject that because you've changed the words of God. Ruckmanites would argue that the underlying text of the King James must literally align with the English words word for word in order to be perfect. I make this statement and oftentimes get labeled a Ruckmanite. I would say this, my King James Bible corrects your TR. The King James Bible did not come from that Greek text you're using if you're using one from the Trinitarian Bible Society. That Greek text came from the King James Bible. Boy, if that isn't Ruckmanism, your King James Bible is correcting the Greek text. Woo, somebody else. <laughs> Here's gonna be the, one of the most blasphemous things that people will, have a hard time swallowing. The King James Bible, guess what? It is superior to what? It is superior to the Textus Receptus. Amen. No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. superior to the Greek. No! And people say, what are you talking about? Because if your TR is different than the King James, then you've got the wrong TR. Right. There is, of course, not a single edition of the Textus Receptus or the Masoretic Text that meets this criteria. It is impossible to translate a large body of text without using synonyms for words or idioms that don't carry over to a different language. It logically follows that, since no one has access to a Greek or Hebrew text that literally translates to the King James without the use of synonymous language, according to Ruckmanites, God did not preserve his word. Just as critical text advocates claim the autographic Greek and Hebrew has been lost, evidently, Ruckmanites have come to the same conclusion. These proponents go so far as to claim that changing speaketh the speaks is a corruption of the text, and that using synonyms is somehow perverting scripture. Yet their claims ultimately deny the doctrine of preservation. When it comes to a translation work, some people would say that they believe the King James goes beyond just simple preservation, but rather God gave the translators another layer of inspiration, sometimes referred to as you mentioned, double inspiration. No, I don't believe in double inspiration. Would you suggest that even the King James is better than the underlying Greek and Hebrew, or is it the same in your opinion? No, the same, in my opinion, yes. When you have people just giving these bizarre statements, if you change speaketh to speaks, you've corrupted God's word. I mean, that's lunacy. When people get this idea that to have a, a, a Bible in a different language and it has to not only have the exact same words in the exact same order, well, that's not possible because sometimes you're not even gonna have a word that matches that word in a different language. So it's, it's silly to take it to that extreme. Obviously, when you have a translation in a different language, they need to say the same thing. 
um, but you can't have a word for word translation. And sometimes even the King James itself, when it's compared to Texas Receptus, in some places you're not going to have a word for word translation because it's not possible. You know, there's certain words in Greek that are not translated word for word in the King James because maybe there might not be a word for it. Or for example, maybe the King James uses a particular idiom in English that is not necessarily found in Greek, but it communicates exactly what the Greek is saying. The Rugmanites will, will hear someone say that and they'll think, you're attacking the Word of God, but it's, it's, it says the same thing, but sometimes it's just not possible to do the word-for-word -word translation from one language to another. King James onlyism is the position that makes sense, but not when you listen to these bozos who are saying, the King James is superior to the Greek and Hebrew. You can't even change a spelling. You can't even change a comma or a parenthesis. It's like that, that, it's so bizarre in light of the fact that it's an English translation from the original Greek and Hebrew. It's hard to believe that anybody actually thinks that way. When we talk about changes to the text, we're not talking about word order or spelling or synonyms. What we're talking about is altering the meaning or the doctrine of the text. When God talked about preserving his words, that's what he meant. And the modern versions should be rejected because they're changing the meaning, they're changing the doctrine of the text, and they're not preserving God's words. The Bible says this, Now the serpent, that's Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, I want you to know, it's the very first time we see Satan in the Bible. In fact, the first words that come out of his mouth in the entire Bible, notice what he says. He says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, God had told them, you're not allowed to, to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the first words that come out of Satan's mouth, he is questioning the word of God. Obviously, we are at war spiritually, and the devil is called our adversary. And so if the devil can disarm his adversary, he's going to do it. And we know what the weapon is. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we should be able to look at the way that Satan attacks um, Christians, the way that Satan attacks believers, the way that Satan tries to attack God, and we should be able to learn from it. Well, if you do that, then the first lesson in the Garden of Eden is that Satan's going to cast out upon the Word of God, question the Word of God, and change the Word of God in order to lead people astray. That's exactly what he did with Eve, and that's what we are seeing today. There's a litany of Bible options out there. And they don't say the same things. They say a lot of different things. And they can't all be right. And you need to, you, you know, you need to at least wake up to the fact that not everything that calls itself a Bible is a Bible. If, if you accept the modern Bible versions as God's Word, then there is no attack on the Word of God. But of course, the modern Bible versions are the attack on the Word of God. Because when you compare them to the King James Bible and to the Texas Receptus, they're, uh, completely different. Obviously, they're teaching heresy, they're teaching different things, but it, it's, it's interesting to me that here you have, you have Paul telling you, hey, people are corrupting the Word of God. You have the Garden of Eden, you know, you have all throughout the Bible, um, you have, it's clear that Satan is attacking the Word of God. The modern Bible versions are certainly different than a King James Bible, which can easily be demonstrated when compared, which show the consequential changes they're making to doctrine. Micah 5.2, a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in the last part of this verse, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And of course, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was not a created being, he's from everlasting. In the NIV, it says, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So the NIV says that he has an origin and he's just from an old time. No, no, no. He's not from an old time, he's from everlasting. Why would they attack that Jesus Christ is coming from everlasting? Because you know what? They want to take away the deity of Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, verse 14, the King James Bible says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 
So according to the Bible, it's a narrow way because there's only one way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the New King James, which some would suggest, oh, well, the New King James, that's coming from the same family. But it actually changes the King James Bible here. This is what it says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Now, wait a minute. There's a difference between there only being one way and it being difficult. The New King James wants to suggest that salvation is difficult, whereas the King James says there's only one way. Heretics like John MacArthur will take this verse and in his commentary, he has his own New King James Bible commentary. He'll say, yeah, salvation is difficult because it takes a life of works and dedication and turning from sin. Why? Because he loves to teach works-based salvation and he loves to use the New King James to do it. Why would I want to use a Bible that teaches work salvation? How could you say that these are the same? They're saying completely different things. They're twisting scripture. They're perverting salvation by faith. They're perverting the God that we believe in. It is not the same Bible. What we're seeing with the, a lot of these modern versions is that they're removing things. They're changing doctrines. They're saying something completely different. They're misconstruing what salvation is. You knock on the doors of people who use these modern versions, who go to these modern type churches, they can't give you a clear answer about salvation. Are you 100% sure that if you die today, you're saved? I hope so. I believe so. What are you placing your faith in? Well, you know, I keep God's commandments. You gotta walk with God, you gotta have a relationship with Him, you gotta love the Lord. All these obscure, ambiguous answers. Yeah. Or sometimes you're running to people who go to these churches, they use the modern versions, and they're just complete, they've been there for 20 plus years, and they still don't know if they're saved or not. And so, you know, that's the fruit of these modern versions. You say, why is it that these lame churches are just not preaching hard? They're not being authoritative. They're not. Well, look, I wouldn't be either if I was just guessing at it. If I, if I wasn't even sure if this was the Bible, I'd be like, well, you know, I don't know. Let me give you a verse and kind of fill my sermon with a bunch of stories and jokes and poems because I'm not even sure if this is legit. I've never seen a church that uses an NIV and is just super solid on salvation. When you compare American churches specifically, do you notice a difference between a church that's not using King James Bible versus churches that use a King James Bible in America? Oh, absolutely, yes. More liberal. If Satan is going to attack the Word of God, one would think he would focus on Bible translations with the most fruit. The fruit of the preserved line of scripture, especially the King James, is apparent. From sound preaching to changed lives, the King James Bible has powerful fruit. What has God been blessing in our lifetime? What has God been blessing in recent history? It's been the preaching of the King James Bible. You know, throughout the 20th century, if you look at the great soul winning movements, if you look at the great preaching that was done, it was all done out of a King James Bible. When you look at the righteous remnant that is preaching hard, that is standing against the sodomites and the feminists and all the weird stuff that's going on, it's always somebody with a King James. The churches that are standing strong are the churches that are preaching out of the King James Bible. I got saved from a King James Bible. You got saved from a King James Bible. I got saved because a King James Bible believer man led me to Christ. And then all my support, my ministry comes from King James Bible believers. Millions of people out there got saved from the power of God's Word and directly it was through a King James Bible that they encountered God's Word. And so that's the fruit. And we see the fruit of these Bibles. Whereas show me the great soul winning movement coming from James White. I would make the argument that the greatest churches, the soul winning churches, the ones who are preaching hard against sin, that, that you know, the churches that I would bother attending are, are all using the King James Bible. You say, how do you know that God's word is found in the King James? Well, I don't know, maybe because it's been used by more preachers more soul winners, more missionaries than any other Bible in the history of mankind. How about that? Isn't the tree known by its fruit? The devil has sown a lot of confusion around what is the Bible. And ultimately one must place their faith and what they believe is the scripture. Would you rather choose a Bible that God has handed down to us, fits the doctrine of preservation, has a clear lineage, one that's been used by many different Christians throughout generations, one that has sound doctrine, or a Bible that is ever-changing, 
found in obscure locations, no clear lineage, always being updated, sown a lot of confusion, all kinds of liberalism and heresy being taught from that Bible. The choice is obvious. The King James Bible is the only Bible that fits the doctrine of preservation. The King James Bible is not predicated on corrupted manuscripts. It's not based on a philosophy that says God's word was buried for centuries. It's built on a manuscript tradition that was actually used by Christians and passed down to the next generation. It is the culmination of a providentially guided refining process that produced the most read Bible of all time and the most influential work of scholarship in the history of the world. It is the standard. It is the perfect Word of God. It is the inspired Word of God. It is, simply put, the preserved Bible. This is the Bible, the King James Bible, and the underlying Greek text that brought us the King James Bible is the Bible that has been used since the first century, when we're talking about the New Testament. It's the one that's been used by, what well, was used by early Christians and has been used every generation since then till, till today. I believe the King James Bible is the pure of God. It doesn't need to be changed. The original inspiration is not lost when it's translated, unless it was translated inaccurately. But if you translate the exact same words of God, they're still just as inspired. What you have now is the preserved inspiration of God's word. The weeds of the field, the ESV, the NIV, the Living Bible, the Message, the New Living Translation, the Revised Standard Version, these things are like grass and they're just being eaten up by the lawnmower of time and they keep changing and they keep dying and then they get resurrected and they get gnarlier and gnarlier and they get worse and worse. You know what Jesus said we needed? Not only did we need the Word of God, but that we needed every word of God. You know what I'm holding in my hand right now in this King James Bible? I've got every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And don't ever be shy about being King James only. Don't ever be like, well, you know, yeah, yeah I mean, we're King James. You know, you know what the attitude should be? Of course we're King James. Of course we're King James. What, don't you believe that God preserved his word in every generation? Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's God's responsibility to preserve it. And you know what? He takes that responsibility very serious. And you know, we have a great uh, Bible translation here from the original text, from the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic, and it's perfect. It's, it's, it, we, we should be able to trust this because God said that he would preserve it. This is the word of God. It's perfect, it's preserved, it's inspired, and thank God we have it in our English language. What a blessing. And we only use this because we believe that this is without error. This is inerrant. As a pastor, I sit in that office and I look across the table at people with real issues and real burdens and real problems and they need real solutions and I can't just sit there and say well here's what I think you should do here's what might work here's what God might want you to do I mean I'm not really sure because I'm not even sure if this is legit look you and I I can't raise my kids on maybe I need to raise my kids on yes this is the Bible this is the word it's inerrant it's infallible I can trust the Bible and you look at the modern textual critics today like James White, they don't have a Bible they're gonna point you to. They don't say use this specific translation. They simply say, trust me as your guru and I'll tell you what the Greek really says. But you know what? That is the same as the Catholic Church who wanted to take the Bible out of the hands of the people and say, let me tell you what the Latin says. That's why this is such an important doctrine. We need to get people on a King James Bible and believe it that it is the Bible before we can start getting anywhere in this country. You wanna change America? Get everybody to get a King James Bible in their hands again. Get everybody to believe that this book is God's word, that this is the preserved Bible. Because if you don't believe this is the preserved Bible, you don't even have a Bible. You say, why do you guys preach the Bible so much? Why do you have so much Bible? Because we believe this thing. Because we believe that this will actually 
bring salvation. We believe that this will bring the abundant life that God promised. We believe that this will save your marriage. It will help your children. It will help your finances. It will help your health. It will help you in every relationship of life. Because it's true. I mean, don't you believe when Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away? Of course we don't believe in a Bible that was dug up in an archaeological dig 1,800 years after Jesus, 1,900 years after Jesus. That's not God's word. If you walk out of here and you're like, I don't know, I didn't get it. It's because you're not paying attention. It's because you're not interested in the things of God. And look, if there's one thing that we should be interested in, it's the word of God. Realize the treasure that you have. Realize the power of that book. And I hope you'll go home and read it every day because you'll realize, wow, God has given me his perfect word. I've got 31,000 some odd verses, 1189 chapters straight from the mouth of God, straight from the mouth of God, unfiltered. This is what God said. This is what God wants you to hear. Have you read it? Read it. And anyone with any kind of honesty and integrity in their heart would realize these are major differences. I can't just accept these alterations to the text. I need to be faithful to God's word. I need to change my mind and I need to get a preserved Bible, the King James Bible.